Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. What is going on, everybody? Happy Fugazi Friday. I had the night to think on the schedule, and I realized I wanted to break down every game. All 32 teams, every game, and that's what we will do today. Just kidding. Did, though, think about some things that I'm guilty of, and just big picture when it comes to schedule. We talk a lot about like the meat of the schedule, you know, a tough stretch or the end of a schedule. And I think we got to be careful about that. Uh, Some news out about some teams are underdogs. Two teams are underdogs in every single game. And uh, the Niners are actually the only team that is favored in every game. Obviously a lot can change. A couple quick thoughts there. Uh, Trey Lance and the Cowboys plan on him, giving him a uh, more reps basically putting Cooper Cup and and even Dak and and giving him a a lot of reps because they got to find out what they got. Uh, Financially, you got to make some decisions. And then just a couple other uh, little things when it comes to football and obviously Fugazi Friday. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's fun time. We got the schedule. We know the games. And the best part for you guys, you can buy tickets to the games you want to go to. And luckily enough, for you, I'm partnered with an official ticketing partner of this show. They they happen to go by game time. So just download that app, promo code John, save 20 bucks. You go to any game. College Pro. I just did an interview today that will play in a couple weeks with uh, my guy from Florida State. And you want to go to a big college game? I've always wanted to go to a game either in the SEC, Florida State, or Clemson. I'm going to have to make that happen in the next couple of years. So if, if you want to go to an event this summer, uh, watch a baseball game, get out in the sun, a concert. I, I need to go to a concert, get get uh, get my singing on, have, have a few brewskis, take a friend, take your dad, take your mom, take your son, take your daughter, and just have a good time. Do it on us. Because taking the guesswork out of buying tickets is easy with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code JOHN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code J-O-H-N. That's my name, John. For $20 off, download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Well, when the schedule comes out, it's crazy. You're trying to keep an eye, you know, whoever you're a fan of. Obviously, you're seeing the schedule. When's our bye week? When's our Thursday night games? Now, because of the emphasis and the relationship that is clearly going really well with uh, with Amazon, which is smart by the NFL to get in bed with them because of the amount of money, the amount of power they have. Their Thursday night schedule is a lot better because they no longer just throw random teams and shitty games on there. That's why a lot of teams play twice, which we could argue is unfair, uh, but the NFL is not consumed with fairness. They really don't care. This is why I disagree with Colin when he says the league is trying to do this or that. They're just trying to get the highest rating. That's really all they're caring. They don't care who wins and loses. Let's face it, 100 plus million people are watching the Super Bowl no matter what. And the reality is these deals are already signed. Like the NBA has been diminishing in viewership for a long time. Doesn't mean they make any less money. The partners do. But we all know a lot of people are going to watch football. The reason they put the Jets on Monday night against the Niners, because it's Aaron freaking Rodgers and a New York team. Last time I checked, New York is the biggest city in America. So all these primetime games, and specifically Thursday, are about getting the big brands, getting the good teams, and the good quarterbacks involved. That's why I think the opening weekend, or week, I guess, because it starts Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, and Monday, are just big brands, star quarterbacks. Like, they're just not messing around. And great teams. They're they're not messing around. Where they used to kind of throw leagues and and Colin and I talked about this Monday night football got a bad stretch of games for a while Thursday night football 
before they really got aggressive these last two years was very, very hit or miss. And someone who does this for a living, and I, I can't, like, I don't go out on Thursday night. Like, there's no dinners or anything because I'm watching the game because I'm going to record a podcast. I like it a lot more. I'm very, very, uh, ha- have a lot of gratitude on this side that they put good games on that slate. Now, it does suck. It is, like, one thing I was thinking about last night is we talked about schedules, me and Colin, and I did on my own little 25, 30-minute podcast about, like, oh, the meat of the schedule is really tough. Or That is a crazy ending to the schedule. We talked about that with the Steelers. I think it's basically impossible to guess what anything is going to look like after the first several weeks. Injuries, teams that you thought were going to be good are going to be bad. Obviously, there are certain teams you know if you're going on the road to Baltimore or on the road to Kansas City or on the road to Buffalo. There's just a weather component, and they have been consistently good for a while. But they're the, the middle portion of the league, like you got no clue if Atlanta's going to be any good or not. Most of us thought, thought Tampa was going to suck last year. They didn't, right? So you just got to be very, very – Minnesota, are they going to win eight games or are they going to win five games? I don't know. I got no clue. I, I have no feel for them. If you told me they were competitive this year, I'd believe you. If you told me they end up drafting in the top seven, top seven, totally believe you as well. Seattle, I've heard a lot of people like, they're a team to keep an eye on. They have a first-time head coach who's under 40. And Geno Smith's their quarterback. So just assuming they're going to be what they were the last couple of years, I can't do that. Their offensive coordinator has never coached in the NFL. Before the University of Washington, he never coached at Power 5 as a coordinator. And I like Ryan Grubb a lot. I put the most money I've ever put on a game last year, basically because him versus Sark's defense. And I profited. But you never know. Like, this stuff is crazy. We have a pretty good idea who's going to be good, the high-end teams. But what happens if you're playing the Lions and Jared Goff had got a concussion the week before? So if the Lions are on your schedule week 10 or week 5, who knows? Things change so dramatically, so fast. What if Lamar Jackson were to miss a couple games? All of a sudden, that Ravens game is a tad bit different. The other thing is, we're going to have a lot of young quarterbacks playing, right? Jaden Daniels, starter. Caleb Williams, starter. Bo Nix, starter. And by the time you play the Patriots or Minnesota, their two rookies could be in. Penix is the one guy, if Cousins is healthy, probably won't play. But everyone else, like last time I checked, rookies, C.J. Stroud is an outlier. Most guys struggle. Bryce Young's a good example. I think Carolina, like I would say most people, they're going to suck. What if this year he takes a huge jump and he's a serviceable, solid starter? You would say they probably would be a little more competitive. So I I think we got to be very, and I'm guilty of this as anybody, but to me the biggest things, which aren't, are, you know, pretty common sense, are if you're a seaboard team, meaning you're Seattle, you're the Niners, you're the the Chargers or the Rams or any of the teams on the East Coast, the long travels, uh, especially on a short week, are challenging. So if you play Monday night football several time zones away, that next game is difficult, right? You get home typically at a weird hour. You're thrown off. Your coaches are thrown off. I don't care how much Adderall and Diet Mountain Dew they're sucking down. It, it, it is It is difficult. And to me, the Thursday games, early on in the season, I don't view them as some crazy uphill battle. Not saying they're not challenging. But if you have a, if your lone Thursday night game is November all, I'm like, that's pretty hard. I don't care when your bye week is. You've played a lot of games. You've been playing for a while. Guys are tired. Coaches are tired. That, that is a big challenge. It's why to me, if you play a road Thursday night game, after Halloween, specifically after Thanksgiving, and you win it, it feels like two wins. I mean, it it feels like a remarkable accomplishment. And the schedule's fun, and it's awesome. And and I, like I told Colin, I am not, I, I have no patience for the fucking losers who cover sports and like, I don't get it. You don't? It's pretty simple. The NFL is king because there's one game a week meaning the games matter. So even if you know the opponents, when you find out when you're playing who, 
what day you're playing the team, and if it's a primetime game, is a pretty big deal. We get it. No one cares about Sunday night baseball anymore. No one cares about regular season TNT doubleheaders on Thursday night. People still really care about this. And it does impact the season. It's their last team sport where the regular season games, when you play them, what time you play them, really, really matter. And one thing, I'll give Colin credit for this. And I think anyone, you know, I I don't know how everybody watches games, but my Sunday in the morning, you know, if there's a big slate, you kind of got to pick and choose who you really need to focus on. You know, if the Ravens are playing the Chiefs and the Texans are playing the Colts and there's some other random games, you, you got to, you can have eight boxes on on my three TVs in my office, but you can't watch everything closely. And you kind of focus on what really matters. And I think one thing's clear with the impact of these primetime games of the league, I would say even doubling down on their importance. And the Fox and CBS afternoon games, now with Tom Brady, and we know CBS, Jim Nance, and Tony Romo get sweet games. The morning games are somewhat of an afterthought. They are by far consistently now, for us on the West Coast, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, the shittiest games on the slate. In a weird way, from an NFL standpoint, kind of the throwaway games, even though they're not. I'm not not saying they don't matter, but from a matchup standpoint, they're usually the worst matchups of 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 the week. And like I said last night, I'm very, very happy that for the most part, the international morning games... I mean, it's it's much easier for you guys on the East Coast. I have a lot of respect for anyone that stays up late for the night games because it was difficult. I've lived it. But the morning games are tough. I mean, getting up, can't even sleep into like 7.30. It's already in the second quarter. But for the most part, they're just bad matchups and not as important to be super locked in. So uh, the league understands they're trying to go international, but they're not trying to go that difficult. I mean, by far the best international game is a primetime game, Eagles in Brazil against the Packers week one, which is easy to consume. So the schedule, we know it. Uh, It was fun. And now we just move on to OTAs and kind of get a feel for, you know, luckily the NFL does a good job of making coaches and coordinators and star players talk every week up until summer break. So it kind of keeps them in the loop, even though they're just in shorts and T-shirts and they're lifting weights. Uh, but it's it's a really big time for your younger players and excited to see what happens over this next month with stuff going on on the field. Uh, you know, the Panthers and Patriots right now are underdogs in every game. That's pretty crazy. Like, you have to be viewed as pretty shitty to not be favored in one game at home. Not even just to be uh, one point favored at home. Now, like I said, It's impossible to play this game. Lines change dramatically, but it shows you, and and I would agree, these would be two teams that most people would circle as like, they should be drafting in the top five. Uh, Obviously, both of them have young quarterbacks. If Bryce Young were were to make a big step, maybe the Panthers could win five or six games. If Drake May were to come in and play and make some plays, same with the Patriots. But – expectations are clearly pretty low. And the one thing I don't understand is the 49ers are the only team favored in every game. They haven't beat the Chiefs since Kyle Shanahan has been there. They lost to him in 2018 when Jimmy Garoppolo tore his ACL. They lost to him in the Super Bowl in 2019. They lost to him two years ago when Christian McCaffrey showed up. And they lost to him again this year in the Super Bowl. Ever since Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid have been together, the Chiefs have owned the Niners. Now, the games have couple, the big games have been close. And I get it's in San Francisco, but th- that would be the one I would circle of like, I'd tell you right now, you should hammer the Chiefs until the 49ers prove that they can beat kind of that unit, right? I, I just think the Chiefs clearly have the 49ers number for whatever reason. I don't care if the 49ers get a lead. I don't care if they're fucking winning in overtime. They just can't beat that team. But glad they play again, and it I would imagine. I haven't even seen probably a CBS game or Fox game afternoon. Tom Brady uh, will be fantastic. That's the other thing. 
I, I, I do think adding Tom Brady, I, listen, Greg Olson's clearly a really high level good guy and he's good at his job. But this reaction of like, I can't believe, you, you can't believe that he got replaced for Tom Brady? W- what are we talking about? It's like, it happens all the time with players. They get replaced essentially by draft picks. It's no different than what's happening here. Except he's Tom freaking Brady. Now, if he's terrible, they'll have a problem on their hands. But if any of us ran a network and Tom Brady wanted to call football games, he's not going to be doing the C-Crew with uh, some random play-by-play guy doing Panthers-Falcons. That's never going to be the case. He was always going to jump to the front of the line. Why? Because his name. Because his name, image, and likeness is that powerful. Now, he's got to prove that he's good. He's got to prove that he's loose, and I'm interested. I don't I don't have a great feel. If I was guessing, he'll probably be solid. But I, I do think because, you know, he's kind of corporate. I know the version we saw in the roast. If we got that version just without the swear words, it would be un- incredible. But most times you see Tom in more of the setting in which he'll be in calling games, he can be a little tighter. If you get the guy in a locker room with with Edelman and Gronk, you have a superstar in your hands. I just I I, I don't know how he's going to figure it out, and obviously he'll get, in theory, get better as time goes on. Many people think Romo's gotten worse. I mean, a big part of Romo getting worse, people don't think he he tries anymore. It's like the knock on him is he got lazy, because when you call football games, it takes a lot of work. You got to watch a lot of film, not maybe as much as when you were a quarterback, but you can't really go through the motions. I remember playing golf with a buddy who uh, does one of the best NBA teams in the league. And we we were on a hole, and we were having a beer, and we were bullshitting about preparation. I said, how early do you get to the games? He's like, my, my time arriving hasn't changed, but for the most part, half the NBA, I could show up and no one would notice. I know all the players, especially teams in our division, we play multiple times. I know their rotations. They've had the same coach for a while. Not much changes. That is not the case with football because personnel injuries happen all the time. Your rosters are so big. You're constantly getting guys getting injured and then a practice squad guy starts or a draft pick from a previous year's a starter. He might be impacting the game dramatically. Uh, the, The rotation of players, it's hard. It takes a lot of work. And that's never been a knock on Tom. You could argue many consider him like the hardest worker in the history of the league. So I, I, I'd i be pretty bullish on the situation. Um, What else? Trey Lance. The Cowboys, I, I think Brian Schottenheimer said on a local radio station, he might have said this on a podcast, that Trey Lance is going to essentially get more reps than normal this offseason in training camp because we already know what we got with Cooper Rush. Dak Prescott, obviously, is a well-established veteran. And we need to figure this out. And I think this is the hard part about quarterback development. Like, Trey Lance has started, I think, four games in his career. Five games in, like, the last four years, if you count his final year in college where the season got canceled and they just played the one game. He just has never played. And when he has, at the NFL level, he has not looked good. It's why when the Cowboys traded for him last year, before the start of the season... He was their third string quarterback the entire year. And right now, to me, if you just have a normal competition, I don't believe he could beat out Cooper Rush. Why? Because he wouldn't get the reps. If Dak's getting the ones, Cooper's getting the twos, and he's getting the threes, there aren't many three reps. You don't have seven-hour practices, especially with no double days. So you almost have to cook the books, which is what the Cowboys are going to try to do. But they can't cut him. Right, If he can't win the backup job, they're basically going to keep three quarterbacks. But if Trey Lance is not able to be the backup quarterback, because they can, he's on the books next year for $5.2 million, basically. Guaranteed, and that's what they would owe him if they cut him. Cooper Rush, they can cut for under $700,000. So if when week one comes, or in the final cuts, if all three quarterbacks are on the roster, it tells you that he can't beat him out. And I think he's just an example of the weird draft that was 2021 and a guy that just hasn't got many reps. And I also think it's, you got to be very careful when you draft quarterbacks super high from smaller levels. 
because it's not very comparable when you're playing Montana State, Weaver State, and Cal Poly. And listen, it's hard evaluating guys at Alabama, LSU, and Ohio State. Imagine evaluating people at the level of, yeah, he played a total of four NFL-level players his entire college career, and three of them were on offense, so he didn't even play against them. Like, you're just not seeing DBs or defensive linemen or linebackers that are going to play at the next level. So it is a hard projection. It's why this stuff, because a huge thing he hung his hat on was character. Really good guy. That's why the 49ers liked him. Super high character guy. I remember when the Colts had a thing go viral. They had like the horseshoe next to his name. And that's, we get on guys that are low character guys, but sometimes you can over-evaluate guys because they're high character guys and their skill set is not quite what you want. A uh, couple other things. ESPN will have the first Hall of Fame game ever. Uh, they've never, usually the Hall of Fame game, at least in recent memory, has always been on Sunday night football. It's been on ABC a couple times over the last like 50 years, but ESPN has never had it, so they, they will have it this year. And I've said for years, hard knocks isn't for me anymore, and there's nothing wrong with that. Some content in the sporting world just is not for me. It's for other people. It just doesn't interest me anymore. And part of it is I've been watching Hard Knocks for so long. I remember when it was much more raw, uncut, and authentic. It was much closer, and it inspired me. Like, I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be in those meetings. And you don't really get to see that anymore. I've been the guy that had to cut people. It sucks, but it's still a part of the business. It's just a reality of the sport. You take 90 people to training camp, you're only taking 53 guys to week one. 10 plus are going to be on the practice squad. Just the nature of the beast. And we just don't really see that anymore. And I just find it kind of boring. It's it's more of a PR campaign, but clearly it works enough. Now they're going to add an off-season hard knocks. I would say this, the in-season hard knocks, which still is not totally for me, is much better than the training camp hard knocks. But the off-season hard knocks, hard pass. The Giants, um, I, I just don't care. But th they're not just doing this randomly. People are clearly watching. And if you want to watch, I don't blame you. I, I don't understand people in like my profession that talk shit about other people, fans that like doing stuff. I, I, I just don't get it. And part of it is, I got news for you, most people in the media don't like you guys. You know, they, they hate the common fan. They, they, they don't relate to the common fan. Uh, I, I try to put myself, like, I, I have a lot of, uh, I, I like to think a lot of attributes. I mean, I haven't not paid for a ticket and, and sat in the stands for the last four or five years, and it's been very healthy for my for my job because I, I thought I was very insulated when I used to sit in the media room. It just, it's like a little bubble of a lot of angry people. But I... Listen, if you want to watch off-season hard, hard knocks, have at it. Uh, I, I got to say it's a, hard, it's a hard pass for me.